A while back, I made a graphic detailing my opinions on cliché alternate history scenarios. Some scenarios, like Huey Long becoming president or Germany winning World War I, are usually pretty entertaining in my opinion, but there are others where it just gets so overdone that the quality stuff is often lost in the sheer amount of content available. The book we're going to be talking about today falls into one of those overdone cliches where the good old US of A becomes a fascist state. But the catch is, this time, Charles Lindbergh is here. The Plot Against America is a novel by Philip Roth published in 2004. It explores a world where Franklin D. Roosevelt was defeated in the presidential election of 1940 by Charles Lindbergh. In the novel, we follow the main characters, the Roth family, during the Lindbergh presidency as anti-Semitism becomes more widespread in America. Philip Roth based his novel on Lindbergh's comments during his time as a spokesman for the America First Committee, and on his own personal experiences growing up in New Jersey. The book was also turned into an HBO miniseries, but I've heard mixed reviews about it. The story is told from the perspective of a young fictional character named Philip Roth, talk about a self-insert character, who's growing up in Newark, New Jersey with his family, his dad Herman, mom Bess, and his older brother Sandy. Charles Lindbergh at the time was running for president under the banner of the America First Party with the slogan, vote for Lindbergh or vote for war. Lindbergh's character is meant to encapsulate the isolationist sentiments of many Americans at the time, something which was very prominent in our own real history. In the years leading up to World War II, a significant portion of the American public and political establishment were already deeply isolationist. The devastation of World War I left many Americans wary of getting involved in another European conflict, and the widespread belief was that the US had been dragged into the First World War by international entanglements and war profiteering, which obviously led to a strong desire to avoid a repeat scenario. There was also a large portion of Americans with German heritage who found themselves uninterested in going to war with Germany a second time, even some who supported the Nazis, like the German-American Bund. The economic disaster that was the Great Depression in the 1930s further fueled this isolationist streak. With widespread unemployment and poverty at home, many Americans felt that the country's focus should be on domestic recovery rather than another foreign war. Thus, some Americans organized into groups that promoted these isolationist ideals like the America First Committee. Founded in 1940, the committee vehemently argued against American involvement in the Second World War. Spokesperson Charles Lindbergh and other notable members like William Gregory and Robert McCormick successfully lobbied Congress for neutrality laws and provisions against war. Their efforts saw the passing of a series of neutrality acts in the 1930s designed to keep the U.S. out of foreign conflicts. And these laws banned arms sales and loans to nations at war, aiming to prevent the factors that many believed had drawn the U.S. into World War I. Charles Lindbergh himself was a vocal anti-communist and isolationist. These popular ideas, coupled with his infamous 1927 non-stop flight from New York City to Paris, the first non-stop transatlantic flight in history, and the launching point for his celebrity career, garnered him widespread adoration from the America First Committee and support from the American public. Lindbergh's policy platform was wider than just these publicly accepted stances, though. Unfortunately, Lindbergh was a eugenicist and engaged in a form of racism called Nordicism, which views the Nordic race, people from Norway, Sweden, Denmark, and other like Germanic regions, as superior and an endangered minority of people. It's important to note that Lindbergh's parents themselves were immigrants from Sweden. Now, it is true that Lindbergh condemned anti-Semitism in public during his life, but most historians agree that in private, Lindbergh was likely an anti-Semite. After learning about the German atrocities against the Jews during the Night of Broken Glass, however, Lindbergh seemed to have changed his mind. In a speech in September of 1941, Lindbergh stated that no person with a sense of the dignity of mankind can condone the persecution of the Jewish race in Germany. Though nonetheless, his efforts to promote anti-warism and Nordicism in America had been and were still praised by Nazi Germany. President Franklin D. Roosevelt disliked Lindbergh's outspoken opposition to his administration's interventionist policies. He's even quoted as saying, If I should die tomorrow, I want you to know this, 
I am absolutely convinced Lindbergh is a Nazi. American author James P. Duffy suggested that the rivalry was even more personal in nature, and that, in some instances, Lindbergh became the target, or at least perceived target, of public ridicule by Roosevelt in an effort to discredit him as a Nazi sympathizer. Regardless of whether or not Lindbergh was a sympathizer in private, his platform gradually grew from just isolationist politics to a more radical, not necessarily fascistic, but certainly unusual ideological stance. He stated that, America's bond with Europe is one of race and not of political ideology, seemingly suggesting that he stood in solidarity with the authoritarian regimes of Europe solely due to their ethnic makeup. This more radical platform crept into the mainstream and began to be tolerated by many within the America First Committee, given Lindbergh's fame and the power he brought to the committee in their lobbying efforts. In The Plot Against America, in the wake of Lindbergh's sudden landslide win against FDR, his more radical views become his political directive. Lindbergh is sworn into office alongside Vice President Burton K. Wheeler, a former Democratic senator from Montana. The novel itself uh, follows the personal and familial interminglings of the Roth family during this time of political turmoil. Philip Roth's cousin Alvin heads to Canada to join the Canadian army and fight the Nazis, but when he comes back, he's lost a leg and is totally disillusioned with the war. Meanwhile, Philip Roth's brother, Sandy, gets sucked into this government program called the Office of American Absorption, where Jewish children are sent to live with non-Jewish families to become more American. When Sandy returns from a farm in Kentucky, he's practically a different person, looking down on his own family and calling them ghetto Jews. Philip's aunt Evelyn marries a conservative rabbi Bengelsdorf, a big Lindbergh supporter. She starts mingling with lobbyists in DC, even dining with the German foreign minister, which only adds more strain to the Roth family dynamics. To make matters worse, in the novel, Lindbergh's administration forms a new version of the Homestead Act, which aims to scatter Jewish families across the US. Philip's family is almost forced to move, but his dad finds a way to stay in Newark by quitting his job and working with his brother. Now, while the personal and familial dynamics of the story are quite interesting, I'd rather not spoil the entire thing. So instead, let's focus on what you're probably all here for anyway, the world building. As I've already outlined, in author Philip Roth's alternate timeline, Charles Lindbergh's presidency leads to the US adopting an isolationist and pro-German stance, avoiding direct involvement in World War II. Lindbergh's administration signs non-aggression pacts with Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan, effectively keeping the United States out of the war. The treaty with Japan lifts the oil embargo on the empire, giving Japan an edge in their war effort. The treaty with Germany prevents Lend-Lease and leads to a much weaker British and Soviet resistance against German attacks. It's this treaty which opens up the Lindbergh administration to the label of fascist from those in America who don't support his policy agenda. Signing a treaty with the leading fascist regime currently ravaging democratic Europe simply doesn't look good from the perspective of the British, the Free French, and the American public. Now, is Lindbergh necessarily a fascist? No, he's still doing all of this within the bounds of the democratic system, which is going to be important later. Uh, the novel gives us little about his economic policies, which is a major component of fascism, and he doesn't seem to have the same fascist philosophy regarding militarism or the rejection of the self in favor of the collective. Uh, he, he hasn't introduced any corporatist policies. He really isn't changing the structure of American society to reflect something akin to the writings of Giovanni Gentile or Gabriele D'Annunzio. It's really sort of this American nativist, somewhat ethno-nationalist, weird policy agenda that's unique to such an enigmatic figure as Lindbergh. Lindbergh has created an ideology that is uniquely American in the sense that it only works in the United States. You can't really replicate this in Europe. It's one of nativism and the supremacy of the United States one which adopts the racial and genetic ideas of the Nazis, but without the revolution and dictatorship that caused the ascension of the fascists in Italy and Germany. Just as Edward Bernstein's evolutionary socialism posited that the ends of socialism could and should be achieved through democratic reform, with Lindbergh, 
eugenics and racial oppression were achieved through democratic means. Nationalism, nativism, and anti-Semitism were seemingly the tenets of Lindbergh's presidency, yet he was a democratically elected leader, just as Roosevelt was. Now it's here that the storyline of the novel takes a turn, actually. Walter Winchell, a prominent Jewish radio broadcaster, becomes a fierce critic of Lindbergh's administration. Leveraging his influence, he runs for president, advocating for a return to democratic principles and opposing the seemingly fascist shift in American politics. Winchell's candidacy polarizes the nation, sparking widespread anti-Semitic riots. He's assassinated shortly thereafter during a rally, seen as a martyr by his supporters. These riots are provoked further by Lindbergh's vice president, Burton K. Wheeler. Then, seemingly out of nowhere, Lindbergh's plane mysteriously disappears with him in it, never to be seen again, and his vice president, Wheeler, takes over the presidency. What a weird, random thing to have happen in the plot, but nonetheless, that's how it continues. Now, Wheeler immediately blames a Jewish conspiracy for Lindbergh's disappearance, using it as a pretext to further crack down on Jewish Americans and political dissidents. But just as the book seems to be at its darkest moment, with rioting in the streets and the erosion of law and order, Japan attacks Pearl Harbor, causing an emergency election to be held, wherein Franklin Delano Roosevelt wins in a landslide, abolishing everything Wheeler and Lindbergh codified into law, and entering the war on the Allied side, restoring the timeline. I'm gonna be honest, I hated that cop-out. That's just so boring. You restored everything back to the original timeline with the wave of your hand. It's not a true alternate history in that sense. So, since I don't want to leave you all on an empty stomach, I think we should tweak the ending of the novel just a bit. For the latter half of this video, we're going to ask the question, what if in the world of the plot against America, within the bounds of, of this uh, world that we've created here, that Philip Roth has created, what if the emergency election was never called and Burton Wheeler remained president after Pearl Harbor, continuing Lindbergh's legacy and policy agenda? Before continuing today's alternate lore scenario, be sure to leave a comment and subscribe. If you want to help contribute to these scenarios or just have ideas you'd like to be made into videos, consider becoming a channel member or supporting us on Patreon. Thanks, now back to the video. Right off the bat, the treaty with Japan has been broken. The United States now declares war on the empire in Japan and the war in the Pacific begins. In response, Nazi Germany has to declare war on the United States in accordance with the tripartite pact. Now we have our teams for the Second World War, and the Allies are a mess. We have a nigh-fascistic United States, a weakened and battered British Empire and Soviet Union, both of whom had been without Lend-Lease thus far, and a resilient but overwhelmed China, all attempting to defeat the Tripartite and their occupied territories. It is in the wake of this entry into the war that I see three possible outcomes for this scenario. Bear with me here. Outcome number one. President Wheeler is convinced by the British to send arms to the Soviets in order to open up a front in the East and weaken Germany's position. This is sort of like our timeline, just with a weird, different America. Option number two. Wheeler does not support the Soviets due to his hardline anti-communism, but still supports the British and Chinese during the war. And option number three. Wheeler, in a more Lindbergh-ish fashion, assigns a separate treaty with the Germans, taking the United States out of the war in Europe and ensuring that America can focus on the Pacific and only the Pacific. But why just pick one? Let's examine all three of these possible timelines. Let's say Wheeler is convinced by British Prime Minister Winston Churchill and key military advisors that aiding the Soviet Union is crucial. Despite his deep-seated anti-communism, Wheeler agrees to send arms and supplies to the Soviets, opening a second front in the East. Back home, Wheeler's decision to support the Soviets weakens his support base. Many Americans, already skeptical of communism, will lose confidence in an anti-communist president working with the very regime they despise. Regardless, 
The war progresses somewhat like in our timeline, but the conflict in Europe lasts decisively longer, as the initial delay in support leaves the Soviet Union struggling to hold back German advance and unable to ignite that wave we saw in Stalin's 1942 strategic offenses. I would estimate it at most takes a year and a half more for the Soviets to start to push back Germany. And the toll that that gap of time would have taken would be tremendous, with farmland being raised, soldiers and civilians killed, and famine gripping the USSR. The delay in Lend-Lease probably would also have profound implications on the feasibility of D-Day. The successful invasion of Normandy in our timeline required an immense buildup of men, materials, and equipment, much of which was supplied through Lend-Lease. Without those nine months of preparation, the British in particular are ill-equipped to contribute to such an ambitious operation. As a result, the Western Allies may need to reconsider their strategy. Instead of a direct assault on Normandy, they might focus more heavily on the Mediterranean and Italy. The Allies might seek to advance through the Italian peninsula into modern-day Slovenia and perhaps begin a deadly campaign through Hungary and Bohemia, hoping to eventually strike at the soft underbelly of Axis Europe. Regardless, the delay in opening a second front gives Germany more time to fortify its defenses. When the Allies eventually launch an invasion, whether it be through Italy or a delayed D-Day type of invasion, they face stiffer resistance. The liberation of Western Europe is a slower, bloodier process. Eventually, in my opinion, the combined efforts of the Allies would lead to the defeat of the Axis powers, perhaps even with the use of the nuclear option, though I have my doubts that this would be considered as viable a strategy in Europe as it had been in Japan. The post-war landscape ends up dramatically different without Truman to shape Europe in his image. The reorganization of the European continent is a daunting task for the exhausted British Empire and the resource-depleted Soviet Union. The real question here is whether or not Wheeler sees it fit to involve the US in post-war reconstruction in Europe. I imagine he would likely have the foresight to see that he needed to prop up European economies to avoid a depression in the United States, especially given that Wheeler, a Democrat, was sympathetic to FDR's progressive economic agenda during the interwar period. Let's say something akin to the Marshall Plan is implemented, just at a smaller scale to prevent the America First Committee from replacing Wheeler with a more isolationist candidate in the next election. Britain, France, and Germany wouldn't be guided into the same post-war democratization and decolonization, the open society, that Truman had advocated for in our timeline. This means fascist Spain and nationalist Portugal aren't demonized. Maybe fascist Italy stays fascist, just under a new figurehead like Fernando Tambroni just 10 to 20 years earlier. We could possibly see some nations return to a more conservative pre-World War I form of government if somehow there was a push to do so. Really, this is all just to emphasize that we have this vacuum of power, and in this vacuum of power, there's a good amount of room for ideological shifts in Western Europe. The West itself becomes a fragile coalition of proto-fascist, conservative, and democratic states, all bound by the need to contain communism. and. Just like how Wilson's administration didn't commit to the League of Nations, Wheeler's administration simply doesn't commit to saving Europe. Speaking of communism, with the prospect of less US intervention on the continent, I could argue that the Soviets would gobble up as much as possible into their sphere of influence. But at the same time, the Soviets were without Lend-Lease, and they have been further devastated by this war. So. Really, it's difficult to say where this is going to go. It, it might just leave some weird vacuum of power in Central Europe that props up nationalist governments instead of socialist governments loyal to the USSR or Western democratic governments loyal to the British and the weird American state in this timeline. But also, while the soldiers and civilians were certainly not in power in the USSR, in our timeline, once the Soviets pushed into Central Europe, they saw what the standards of living were like in the rest of Europe, and hoped that Stalin would bring this to the Soviet Union during his rebuilding efforts. So realistically, I could see the Soviets becoming a more prominent 
or a less prominent force. It literally is just impossible to predict. In the Pacific, though, Wheeler's administration would take a harsher stance on Japan. Instead of aiding Japan's reconstruction, I can see Wheeler insisting on punishment, leaving Japan to rebuild without American support. While domestically, Wheeler blends FDR's economic policies with Charles Lindbergh's social, foreign, and racial policies. The New Deal programs are continued and expanded, while strictly nativist immigration and racial policies are also enforced. At the same time, Wheeler faces the enormous task of transforming the United States from a wartime to a peacetime economy. The big two focuses would probably be in infrastructure and industry, selling goods to ravaged Europe within the domestic market. I can also see Wheeler perhaps taking notes from Mussolini's book, using public works to build monuments which encapsulate the romantic fame and celebrity of Lindbergh's persona in an effort to both cement himself as the successor to Lindbergh in the America First Convention and to ride the coattails of his fame and political power, but also to create jobs and ease the economy out of the wartime economy. This timeline becomes just uncertain. It's uncertain as to whether or not you would see a backlash against Wheeler's administration. It's unclear as to what the fate of Europe is, what kinds of groups will take power in the massive power vacuum that is the European continent, what sort of ideologies are going to rise in a Japan that now has to rebuild itself brick by brick from the ashes of World War II. This timeline is just all uncertainty. Moving on to our next possible outcome. Without American support, the Soviet Union would be unable to withstand the relentless onslaught of the German Wehrmacht. I know that's a hard pill to swallow for some, but the Soviets just don't stand a chance without Lendlis. The Eastern Front in this timeline is a brutal and protracted stalemate, with Soviet resources and manpower dwindling. As the war drags on for years later than in our timeline, Wheeler's administration faces mounting pressure to expedite victory. The decision is made to deploy nuclear weapons, not only to Japan, but also against key German cities and military targets. The aftermath of the war leaves Europe in chaos. The British Empire is severely weakened, having exhausted its resources and manpower. The Soviet Union, crippled by the prolonged conflict and nuclear devastation, struggles to maintain control over its territories. The once powerful Red Army is a shadow of its former self. President Wheeler again faces a critical decision, whether to intervene in the reconstruction of Europe or to adhere to his isolationism. If he does pick up the pieces, the European powers would probably retain smaller colonial empires to support their economies, creating a patchwork of unstable colonial interests across Africa, Asia, and the Middle East. Without a unified vision, Western Europe becomes a collection, again, of semi-independent states, each with its own agenda. Nationalist movements gain traction, leading to a more fragmented political landscape. The idea of a European Union never materializes, and regional alliances shift constantly. There's no European power who isn't utterly decimated by the war, who can lead their region to prosperity. Even more so if Wheeler decides not to fund reconstruction in Europe at all and return to splendid isolation. In this fragmented Europe, nationalism in Germany, Poland, France, and other ravaged nations would take hold, while in the East, the Soviets do not retain a sphere of influence at all, failing to even manage their own fractured federation. The absence of a strong, unified European hegemon, either in the West or the East, leads to increased regional conflicts, socialist revolutions in regions where the economy simply cannot recover, and political turmoil that cannot be fixed by the slow process of democratic reform. Europe is facing a new age of uncertainty, one in which new powers will be born out of conquest, one wherein there is no unified rule of law agreed upon by all nations, a new modern Middle Ages awaiting its renaissance. And now our final scenario. Though it may be debatable whether or not Germany would abandon Japan like this, 
It's possible that President Wheeler, following in the footsteps of Charles Lindbergh's isolationist and pro-German policies, would sign a separate peace treaty with Nazi Germany. This move leaves Britain and the Soviet Union to fend for themselves against the Axis powers. The American public, swayed by Wheeler's promises of peace, accept this decision. With the United States never entering the European theater, the war effort for the US shifts entirely to the Pacific. The Pacific campaign becomes drawn out and grueling, with British support for American operations becoming increasingly complex and strained. On one hand, the British feel portrayed by American abandonment, but on the other, the British, Australians, and other imperial subjects are still under threat from Japanese attacks on their territories. Now, with no Lend-Lease, there's no way the Soviets can continue to support the communists in China. And without Soviet support, the Chinese communists are unable to mount a significant resistance, leaving the nationalists to bear the brunt of the Japanese onslaught. Wheeler would likely form a strategic alliance with the Chinese nationalists in a desperate bid to counter Japanese aggression. The Pacific War would drag on with brutal island hopping campaigns and significant casualties on both sides. The conflict, of course, would reach its climax with the United States dropping atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, forcing Japan into a reluctant and devastating surrender. In Europe, the collapse of the Soviet Union leaves Nazi Germany unchallenged in its domination of the continent. Without American aid, Britain struggles to maintain its resistance, eventually exhausted in facing internal dissent and with political nudging from Wheeler's administration, Britain would be forced into signing a peace treaty with Germany. Germany, of course, like any good bad guys win alternate history timeline, Germany establishes a fascist order across Europe, consolidating power and forcing its ideology. The Reich's commissariats are fortified and become states in their own right. With no American intervention, Mussolini's Italy never falls, nor does Italy have a reason to turn to the Allies. Um, but of course, while Mussolini's vision of a Mediterranean neo-Roman empire would not be realized, fascist Italy would now have control over the Adriatic and a little bit of the Eastern Mediterranean. In Britain, resentment against the Americans and Germans would grow, leading to a rise in perhaps a domestic fascism and nationalism. Economic devastation, the sheer destruction of British infrastructure, the men lost at battle and the shame of their surrender would all lead to a mixture of anti-communism, anti-Germanism, and anti-Americanism evolving into the fuel for a new regime to take power in Britain. East Asia remains in turmoil, with China divided between a battered nationalist government and fragmented communist factions. Japan, humiliated and devastated by the atomic bombings, would face a long and arduous path to recovery, harboring deep resentment towards the United States. The global order is marked by instability and tension. The Cold War as we know it would not materialize in the same way. With fascist Europe, a fractured British Empire, an isolationist United States, and struggling empires in the East all at odds with one another. There is no Nazi hegemony over the world, nor communist or democratic world orders, but instead a much darker world of competing regimes and disunited peoples. Anyway, that's all the time we have for today. If you enjoyed this video or have any critiques or notes, be sure to leave a comment for the algorithm and subscribe if you really liked hearing about the plot against America. You can support us on Patreon by following the link in the description or by becoming a channel member with the join button below. Thanks for your time. This has been the USFZ, signing out.